Hello and welcome back to Bible Study with the Emmanuel Pastors. It's great to be with you. And uh, we continue our journey through Lent today. And before we, we dive in, I uh, want to remind you that the study guides for our, our Bible studies are available mm -hmm. on our website. And you should be able also to find them on the app where you go in to find the, the recording. Um, but we don't always do a great job of staying with them. So that's no guarantee, just uh, <laughs> for the sake of full disclosure, we want you to know our plan for today. Let me pray, and then we will dive in. Sure. Father, thank you today for the chance to study your word and for the promises that you connect to this study and to the work of your spirit and with expectant and thankful hearts we open our bibles today knowing that you will work in us and i pray that the message that we uh, hear and talk about today will have a special meaning for everyone who is who is listening and with confidence um, that that is the case because you have told us so we pray and we begin in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we are in the fourth week of Lent. Mm -hmm. And hard to believe we're, we're that far along That's already. Week. Yeah. Okay. Easter is coming. Yeah. And we're excited about Easter. This is a little, little bit of a commercial. But yeah. um, as you all know, last year uh, Easter was much different. Much different. I hate the word virtual. It wasn't virtual. It was literal. We were. Yeah, yeah. We had Easter. It was just uh, not in the sanctuary. So we're all coming back on the 4th of April this year for our Easter celebration. Is that the right date? 4th of April? Yeah. I think that's right. right. So. Um, First Easter finally back in the sanctuary. It'll be great. Yeah. I can't it'll be great. Okay. Yeah, two years. I haven't been back in the sanctuary that's for Easter. That's crazy. Well, let's dive in. Numbers 21 is where we're going to begin our study. And. This is another example of the incredible connection between the Old Testament lesson and the uh, gospel reading this week. And um, the Old Testament lesson is, is kind of a unique story, one you may remember from your Sunday school days. Right. It's right. great artwork with this story. Yeah, yeah. that's true too. <laughs> um, so let's hear it, Pastor. Sure. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Okay, great story. And, and it opens with... Uh, a note of location from Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And one of the things that, that would be helpful for you to understand geographically speaking is that we're talking about a fairly small geographic area. And it's one, and we studied Exodus and Life Flight this year, and this, this really hit me maybe in a new way. Um, I think my wife even in, even saw this. You know, this was not um, uncharted territory for Moses. He knew mm -hmm. the land well. So this isn't a question of them being lost. <laughs> this is a question of of God uh, working His plan, and and in this case, it's a plan of, of punishment um, for the unbelief of the, the first generation out of Egypt. Um, so what they experience and, and what these directions at the beginning of the text signify is that they're actually going away from Canaan. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the, the people, it seems, are aware of this, and they start to complain. You know, you think about, uh, you'll have this joy in a few years, but uh, when your your kid starts to get impatient sure, on yeah, the trip, yeah. um, it can make the trip a little bit unbearable. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah. <laughs> they became impatient on the way, we hear. And the, and the impatience... Um, turns into sin <laughs> as they speak out against God and against Moses. And what's their complaint? Well, their complaint is uh, really, why are they here? Um, I think when you come out of Egypt with the promise that the Lord's going to provide for you, again, I, maybe it's there's an immediacy of gratification that they're looking for that, you know, they're not in that land of, you know, milk and flowing, you know, honey and yep. everything. So they're they're wondering... You know, what are we doing here? There's no food. Right. Let's just go back to Egypt. I mean, at least we had food. I mean, that's the continual refrain that right. you get throughout their complaints is everything they're dealing with now doesn't compare to even what Egypt was, and they forget how much they were enslaved. So Right. Yeah. And so not only do they say, why are we here, and why is there no food and water, um, they also curse what is phrased in the ESV anyway, um, they curse the worthless mm -hmm. food, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? Do you do you have a, a a word for us on the worthless food? What's the worthless food? Sure. Uh, this is what the Lord provided for, exactly. for them, and which is really a, a bold move on their part to complain that what God has provided by His own means, and really, you know, as we talk about, even from heaven itself, you know, the manna and the quail, right? Um, Certainly, I'm sure it gets redundant and old, but at the same time, uh, they're not having to go get it. They're not having to find it. And in right. this desert land where they couldn't find anything, it's coming right to them. I, I, I joke with some people sometimes that this was the first form of fast food, you know, God's <laughs> version. <laughs> yeah. Bringing it right to you, yeah. right on your doorstep. And to them, it's not worth it anymore. It's not the variety they want, maybe. Who right. knows? But right. Truly. But this is, you know, that, that this um, accusation of the people, um, a that God doesn't provide, and then and then the cursing of what He does provide. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not good. <laughs> uh, it it is in in many ways an utter disrespect for uh, the the will of God, and um, I think at its core is. Um, is unbelief. Mm -hmm. You know, they have rejected what God has mm -hmm. provided, this mm -hmm. bread from heaven, literally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is the term, the phrase that Jesus uses to describe himself. Right, right. right. They also reject, by the way. But um, the judgment is, is swift, it is harsh, mm -hmm. and um, it is vivid. So when you look at six after they're complaining, you have uh, the fiery serpents. And fiery is an interesting adjective here. Um, <laughs> the the word fiery, and I'm not sure, I think this is probably in the notes somewhere mm -hmm. if you have a study Bible, but it really refers to the color of the serpents, um, that they're bronze serpents or reddish, you know, reddish serpents. Um, and the note here in uh, 21.6 says it could also be the, uh, the pain that accompanies the bite. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. good. So... So it's descriptive also of the yep the, the pain they cause mm -hmm. yeah and that the uh, result of this judgment of God is that uh, many people of Israel die mm -hmm. um, and I again you don't have time markers here but if this was immediate if this stretched out over a number of I don't know, days yeah. uh, we don't know but but what does it result in? That they cry out to the Lord again. I mean, it, it really does bring them back, falling on, um, you know, their their wrong and saying, you know, God, we need you. Yeah, very good. And so you have, you know, this is that the pattern. This mm -hmm. is that oh, sin, punishment, uh, repentance, deliverance pattern that you see really throughout the entire Old Testament. Um, they do not learn from their past mistakes, they continue to repeat them, but mm -hmm. this sin of unbelief, which is truly the heart of all sin, mm -hmm. is met with strong judgment from God, 
which causes repentance, mm -hmm. confession, um, a cry for help, Lord have mercy, mm -hmm. and he has mercy. And so what you see here, and this really gets into Moses and his role, is uh, Moses, and this is in verse 7, Moses prayed for the people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you'll note on the study guide this week is this um, term typology. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, I think this is a helpful thing to talk about in regard not only to Moses, but to the entire, ultimately to the entire Old Testament. Sure. Typology, and this is the definition that you have on your study guide. Uh, typology is a special kind of symbolism. A type in Scripture is a person or thing, or I would even say event in the Old Testament, which foreshadows a person or thing or event in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. When we say that someone is a type of Christ, we are saying that a person in the Old Testament behaves in a way that corresponds to Jesus' character or actions in the New Testament. So the question at the end of this note in the study guide is how how is Moses and I would also add how is this event mm -hmm. a good example of typology um, what would you say about that it, understanding Moses as a type of Christ sure I would think one of the places that stands out to me is the interceding for the people yeah, um, that's a huge spot, and we even hit this a couple weeks ago. His mediation for the people. Yeah, and he's the go-between, and we we pulled some of that out a little bit. Jesus is the go-between between God and man. Yeah, here very specifically, more localized with the people of Israel. Moses is the mediator between the people of Israel and God. Exactly. Very good. So you, you know, you see this work of Moses not only delivering the people in that moment, but pointing ahead to the work that, that Jesus does for us. Uh, you know, the passage that you mentioned, the, mm -hmm. the one mediator, there is now one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And the man, Moses, does that, that same type, again, type of work in the story of God's Old Testament people. But there's also typology in uh, this serpent mm -hmm. on the pole. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? What, what have you learned about that over the years? Well, for an aside, real quickly, yeah. um, I'll never forget when I was on Vicarage, I had a gentleman, we were a downtown parish kind of like this, and a gentleman came to the door, uh, I think was looking for some food, but as you know, with people that you meet that come up out of the blue, uh, you never know what kind of knowledge or purpose that they have when mm -hmm. they come by. And this gentleman, I think, was looking for a place to rest for a second and talk. Yeah. And all of a sudden he goes, he talks about this bronze serpent. And do you know its name? And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, crap, I, I'm not sure <laughs> that I ever knew it had a name. And... He proceeds, he's like, give me a Bible, and shows me where all of this comes to fruition a little bit more. And so I, I don't mean to take us away from no, that question. go but, for it. Um, there's an account in 2 Kings chapter 18. I was looking at this earlier. All where right, people. the people of Israel take this gift of God, where he heals them by, you know, this serpent. Yeah. And it's in verse 4. And they have turned it into an idol that Hezekiah has to take down. And it says here, the name of the serpent <laughs> was Nehushta. Easy for you to say. Yeah, right? And they, they, you know, the note says that that might be a combination of the words bronze serpent. You know, that might be where it comes from. But this gentleman just comes out of the blue, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. I had no idea. And so yeah. you learn something every day, and you get humbled by wow. whoever comes by. That's a door. great story. Yeah. That is a great story. So. I, I don't think you've ever, I, I think I remember you talking about that, but I yeah. forget that this was the... Jumped out to me. But, so what, what we have here then with this bronze serpent is the Lord uses this serpent that's raised up on a pole yeah. to heal the people. They look to it, and because of the Lord's promise, they are healed when they look at it. This takes us really into the, the gospel reading, I believe, as we move forward, where... Uh, 
Christ himself was the one lifted up on the pole, yeah. and he even draws this connection even clear, more clearly for us uh, to the point that we see our healing comes yeah. from him. And so if you, you play out that typology, mm -hmm. um, this idea of, of the serpent. Now, obviously, there's a connection to the serpents who bite the people. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the symbolism of the serpent, mm -hmm. um, you know, you see it from Genesis to Revelation, where the ancient serpent is talked about in Revelation. But we're talking here about, uh, about the devil and about sin and all that sin has brought into our human experience, the brokenness, the pain, the sickness, the death, the, the mourning, all of it is, is symbolized in this, this serpent. And you, you know, you wouldn't, in, in a sense, it, it's an odd thing. You, why would they look at the, right. the very thing that afflicts them? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is one of the clearest examples of how the Old Testament points us ahead, but you know what? What do we see on the cross? What do we see on the pole? Mm -hmm. uh, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, it, this this is absolutely um, a, an example, a, a type of crucifixion. They they look to the to the cause of their judgment. And when they see their sin up on the, the pole, and by the way, a snake's not going to hang on a <laughs> pole. I mean, we're talking about a cross here. Yeah. When they see their sin on the cross, uh, they are uh, saved. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is a beautiful description of the work of Jesus for us, and it becomes a reference point for mm -hmm. The words that Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? This is this yeah, is good. That, th it's great stuff. And there's a couple points that I just want to draw yeah. out here too. One, uh, this symbol. Yeah. Not only is it very biblical and everything, but we see it with some of the life insurance. You know, the Blue Cross Blue Shield. Sure. Some of the EMS. That's the very symbol that they have. Right. Up on there. I mean, so it's amazing how that has infiltrated even our own society, yeah. in a way that we don't remember maybe as much anymore. But that's. That's the heart of that image. Great biblical illusion. Yeah, you know. is that healing? Yeah. And the other thing, based on you know, as you drew us back to Genesis, this shows us a difference between God and man. You know, God can take the very things that have ruined mankind, like the serpent. You know, yeah. the the devil's tool for bringing sin into this world, tempting Adam and Eve, and use that as a means for his salvation or bring healing. Yeah. And the people again can take those things that God has instituted, and that's where that story from Second Kings come into play, mm -hmm. that God has instituted for healing and relief and turn them into idols. Yeah. And so that, that's a huge difference between God and man. What God has made good and, and cleans up and declares for his good purposes, so quickly we can turn around and worship that instead of the one who... Yeah. You know, sets it up and puts Absolutely. his power behind it. Well, and that's a perfect example of how the children of Israel continue yeah. to repeat their their sinful and idolatrous uh, unbelief. Um, they actually that, that's an awesome reference. Yeah. They yeah. actually take the bronze serpent and melt it down for an idol. Second Kings eighteen four. I wrote it in my Bible. <laughs> you should do that. Your Bible should be filled with notes. It's a it's a working study document, yep, so it is. jot it down. I always write in pencil, though, because I make mistakes. Smart man. Yeah. Smart man. All right, we're going to jump ahead to the gospel reading, and the gospel reading is one of the most well-known, mm -hmm. or at least it contains one of the most well-known passages in the entire Bible, and that is John 3.16, but that is not um, in isolation, and like all of our um, lectionary readings or pericopes that's another one of those church words that we use to describe the the weekly readings pericope mm -hmm. every pericope every reading is set in a larger context and so uh, rather than just um quoting john three sixteen, mm -hmm. for god so loved the world you could probably all finish that uh, we need to back up kind of pan out 
and look at the, the larger context because it really does help us understand what's going on here. So, with that in mind, listen to the text and then we will um, we'll dig in. Do you want to begin at verse 4 or do you want me to jump back to 1 just um, for the sake of who he is? Well, I think, uh, why don't you back it up? Because that's one of the questions on the study okay. guide was actually like about... Um, the, the, the second most important character in this reading. Okay, all right. Well, we'll start at verse 1 today, even though the actual reading doesn't start there. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Good, and it's helpful. Um, that really does uh, encapsulate the entire Nicodemus sure. story. Yeah. Very good. I'm glad we backed it up. So who's Nicodemus? What do we learn in that in that reading? Yeah, leader or ruler of the Jews. Yes, and Pharisee. not only, he's a Pharisee, and, yeah. and but not only just a Pharisee, he's a prominent yep. Pharisee. He's yeah. part of the, the Jewish ruling council, which probably explains um, the reason for his midnight approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as we all know in studying the Gospels, the Pharisees are not... Um, fans of Jesus or the message that he brings or the um, attention that he garners. And so uh, Nicodemus is an interesting character. He is certainly one who acknowledges that what Jesus says and does, and he, he references the signs that he does, mm -hmm that they're not from man, they are from God. And this begins this, this conversation about being born again. And that's a phrase that's often referred to in Christian circles. Mm -hmm. um, the meaning of that phrase can be different mm -hmm. depending oh, on your tradition. Yeah. Uh, but what, what do we mean? What, or what, what does Jesus mean? Right. And what, I guess, how do we interpret Verse sure. 3, uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Sure. And based on some of the conversation, we see very clearly that 
he's not talking about another physical birth. That's what Nicodemus kind of right. jokingly <laughs> asks him. I, I mean, not maybe. Certainly. Yeah, I don't know where he is on that, but <laughs> right. certainly clarifies. And so Jesus, um, in that clarification, talks about water and the Spirit. And we often, and I think really with a lot of other scripture behind it, see that in baptism, that there is yeah. a new birth there through uh, the font through what yeah. God proclaims, especially as we look at the tail end of, you know, Matthew's gospel and right. uh, all of that, that there is um, the life of a believer sealed in that moment by yeah. that gift. Yeah, and so you you know you have um, this imagery of of baptism and the work of the Spirit, and it's important to understand what that means. So. In Romans, Paul talks about um, in baptism we are buried with Christ. Luther says daily the old Adam must be drowned and die, a reference to baptism. And, and the connection between baptism and the death of the old Adam, the death of the natural man, the death of the, uh, the heart we are born with is a really important thing to understand. Because the promise that follows that death is the promise of new life, uh, a gift from the, the Spirit. And so you hear in Acts chapter 2, Peter's Pentecost sermon, which cuts the people's heart because mm -hmm. he's convicted them of rejection of the Messiah. And they say, what are we going to do? And his response is very simple. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So we always connect baptism to the, the work of God, the killing and raising work of God. Uh, the man of, of works is put to death. The man of faith is, is given life, and that is the, the man of the Spirit. So I think that's a really important understanding when you look at what Jesus tells Nicodemus. And then, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot here, then you get into this language of um, earthly things versus heavenly things. And, and you, can, you can see how Nicodemus is struggling with this teaching. Um, and Nicodemus... Jesus says, you know, well, you, you ought to know this <laughs> because you know the Bible. Um, and then he says, listen, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then there's this reference, uh, which ultimately is a reference back to our Old Testament lesson. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So he's talking about the Christ himself, the gift of God, the promise kept, and then he connects the, the work of the Christ to Moses. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And that language is really key, especially in John's Gospel. Mm -hmm. The language of, of lifted up. What does that make you think of when you hear that? Uh, when I hear that, it's John 12, then, when Jesus says, And I am, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. So he carries that throughout his right. ministry. And John makes that very clear, as you said. So um, it certainly moves me towards the crucifixion. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, you know, th and this is where the, t the typology of the Old Testament is mm -hmm. confirmed in the words of Jesus. Um, being lifted up from the earth, John 12. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about the cross. And so uh, Jesus not only connects the dots to the Old Testament, but points ahead to what this means. Mm -hmm. And it's not just being saved from the, uh, you know, the, the, a deadly snake bite. Mm -hmm. um, right. It is eternal life. And that leads us into the the very well-known proclamation of the gospel for God so loved the world. Different deadly snake bite, if you will. Absolutely, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's. It's not a coincidence. <laughs> there are no coincidences here. 
that the snake is used as the symbol yeah. of sin. This connects right back to the garden. Good. I'm, I'm kind of going on and on. Anything yeah. else you see as, as you, you know, unpack um, John 3, 16 through the end of the reading, 21? Oh, I think um, one of the things, again, is just the affirmation of, you know, why Jesus came. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly we see that when God comes onto the scene, his holy, righteous uh, person uh, does drive out sin and pull it out. I mean, Jesus' ministry is all about that as the demons cry out and, you know, plague him. Uh, you see that coming out. But the purpose, again, for him coming is to save. Yep. And I think that that's always critical for us as we continue throughout this world because uh, we do see the effects of sin. We feel it as God's Word exposes them in our own lives and in yep. the lives around us. And while that happens and we don't avoid that and run from that, we also see that, again, God's purpose in that exposure is to bring us into the light of salvation, yep. into His Gospel. And so right. um, to keep that perspective always in mind because there are moments where um, that intensity of God's word or the light that that word you know reveals in our lives uh, really does weigh down on us sometimes yeah. and I think it's always yeah. good to keep his purpose behind that is always to save so there's this amazing conversation middle of the night mm -hmm. between Jesus and a prominent Pharisee uh, is this the end of the story with no. Nicodemus? So yeah. what happens? It's kind of neat. We don't get many of these. We don't. It's a great rest of the story yep. kind of moment. So talk about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. As you might recall, when we get to Jesus' crucifixion, after it's been confirmed that he is dead, uh, Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, are the two that take Jesus' body and actually put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And so we see here that following through this account, Nicodemus, who struggles here in this moment, claims that Jesus has to be doing God's work, but can't understand how God can work a spiritual rebirth, mm -hmm. and struggles here uh, in faith, yeah. continues to, by God's grace, cling in his faith to the yeah. point that he's the one uh, burying Jesus after this point, and really right. gives us the sense that going forward, he is a believer. Yeah. And uh, really a neat account. Again, taking the fact that the Pharisees are some of the most vehement opposition to Jesus this yeah, whole time. Yeah. So, yeah, we will take that as a, mm -hmm. a good sign. Oh, I think so. I think that's exactly right. And, um, and so these words in the middle of the night take root. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's an important application, too. Don't ever... Uh, write somebody off. Don't ever underestimate the power of the gospel to save. And uh, you may not hear the rest of the story with the people in your life that you that you uh, talk to about Jesus, but but the Spirit is working, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's one of the neat aspects of this yeah. of this reading. So I think we're probably about there today. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, the devotional thought that's on your study guide is, I, I love it, it's from the Lutheran Study Bible, mm -hmm. and um, you just listen and then, um, and then we'll end in prayer. As Moses guides God's people in the direction of the Red Sea, away from their primary objective of the promised land, rebellion begins anew. Our lives also persist in the pattern of rebellion, repentance, and restoration. Those in Israel who repented received God's salvation by looking to the sign of his mercy in faith. And so will we. And that last line is an important one to remember. Uh, let's close with a prayer and then we'll, uh, we'll end our study here. Father, thank you for uh, these incredible readings today that point us to your cross and to your sacrifice for sin so that we may live and, and give to us the assurance of that gift and the promise that we have in Jesus. It's his name. In his name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today.